Okay, next is Bernie Crispy with a rather interesting title, Imagination as Well, you don't have to read the whole thing, it's okay. <laughs> Take up my time. phenotype of autism spectrum and psychoaffective spectrum conditions, evidence from schizophrenia, genetic risk scores. How's that? Do I have any time left? No, I don't need that, thanks. I wanted to thank the organizers of the meeting and especially Randy for making, making all of this happen. Today I'm going to be talking about disorders of human social behavior and one of the main points I, I want to make is that psychiatric conditions involve alterations to evolved adaptations and they should be defined and diagnosed in this context, which is an explicitly evolutionary context. What has evolved in humans is what can and does go wrong in humans. Uh, with Christopher Badcock of the London School of Economics, I've developed a model in this context which uh, we refer to as the diametric model of autism and psychotic affective conditions. So what we have here in the middle is a set of human evolved or human elaborated traits. The first six of them here are explicitly social traits and these traits are reduced in autism and they are specifically increased or overdeveloped to dysfunction in psychotic affective conditions which include schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, major depression, borderline personality, and a variety of, of others. So here social traits are dialed down in autism and essentially dialed up in psychotic affective conditions. So like any, like any biological system, you can have alterations in two opposite directions towards either underdevelopment or overdevelopment. And then by this model in, in autism, we have for non-social traits, we have relative and absolute enhancements on the autism spectrum and we have selective reductions in these non-social traits uh, and in psychotic affective conditions, especially well known in schizophrenia. So in, in the world of psychiatry, this is actually quite a, a, a radical and novel model to think that these sets of conditions can actually be, be opposite to one another, but it's a model that flows naturally from an evolutionary perspective on mental adaptations related to sociality. One can visualize the model in, in two dimensions, non-social traits on the y-axis, social traits on the x-axis, balanced perception, cognition, effect in the middle. And these little vectors here can be rep represent uh, effects of alleles for different conditions, psychotic affective conditions down here, and autism spectrum conditions up here. So we're, we're, we're basically at the, the extremes of adaptation and at the extremes of, uh, of, of trade-offs. So we've been testing this model, collecting data from normal people, from non-clinical populations. We've got data from about 2,000 college students so far. We have been genotyping them for a variety of SNPs, uh, relatively well-validated autism and schizophrenia risk SNPs. That's what I'll talk some, some about today. Also hormone-associated SNPs and imprinted genes. And then we've been collecting data from them on the autism spectrum quotient and the sky is a typal personality questionnaire. These are just the degree to which we can categorize normal people as expressing some degree of autistic traits or, or some degree of traits that are a little bit schizophrenic. We can put people on continuous scales with regard to these disorders, even if they are normal people. So this is some uh, results from principal components analysis of the autism spectrum and the schizotypy spectrum data. And these are the different subscales for each of these 
questionnaires. And if you look here at principle component two, what you have is the pattern that you expect if there is an axis that goes from positive schizotypy, that is the, the presence of schizophrenia-like traits, an axis that goes from positive schizotypy on one hand to autism on the other hand. So the coefficients here are positive, strong and positive for schizotypy and the opposite, negative for autism. So this is what we expect if there exists on a psychological level a, a, a spectrum with these two disorders at opposite ends from one another. Now what is interesting about the pattern of loadings on the principal components is that the strongest loadings are found for two conceptually related subscales. The, among the highest loadings for autism is this imagination subscale. Autism is characterized by low imagination and then the highest loading for the schizotypy spectrum is his magical thinking, which is essentially pathological, excessively high imagination. So we have a pattern here where it looks like aspects of imagination are contributing disproportionately to each, disproportionately strongly to this axis from autism to positive schizotypy. And these results actually fit quite well with a long history of research going back to Aristotle that has linked imagination with madness, especially with schizophrenia and, and bipolar disorder. And this work has been uh, nicely described in a book by Dan Nettle called Strong Imagination some years back. So many of the symptoms of psychotic affective disorders, especially schizophrenia, can be considered as as disorders involving excessive, pathologically excessive imagination. So imagining voices, imagining that people are out to get you, other social sorts of delusions, hypermentalizing, being, being overly social in one's thoughts. So many of the symptoms, especially of schizophrenia, but also of, of bipolar depression to some extent can be seen as symptoms uh, representing excessive imagination. This doesn't mean that people who have schizophrenia are more creative. What it means is that there is overlap between imagination and creativity and psychotic affective conditions and there's a set of traits that contributes to both of them. Now if you look at autism, one of the characteristic features of autism is a lack of pretend play and both of the major features of autism, deficits in sociality and the presence of restricted interests, can be considered as evol involving reduced imagination. So reduced theory of mind in the context of deficits in sociality and reduced non-social imagination leading to restrictive interests and repetitive behavior. One can conceptualize imagination semantically in this sort of network, forming new ideas, images, or concepts of external objects that are not present to the senses. And one can certainly imagine that imagination has been one of the major so mental selective targets in human evolution, in particular stimulus independent thought, mental imagery, future thinking, essentially play in the mind, thinking about other people, thinking, planning about what you're going to do, thinking about your, thinking about yourself in a social world and imagination centrally involving the social brain, involving language and creativity and generative, generatively leading to cumulative culture. One can, however, instantiate imagination more directly neurologically. There is a major system of the brain called the default mode network, which has three hubs in the posterior cingulate, the medial prefrontal cortex, and the, and the parietal lobe here. This is a brain network that is selectively active when you're basically not doing anything, when you're, when you're focused internally and when you're essentially daydreaming, when you're thinking about yourself, you're thinking about other people, you're thinking about your future, you're thinking about your past. And this network 
is selectively reduced in activation in autism and there's lower connectivity in this network in autism and in schizophrenia this network is more strongly activated and more strongly connected. Now we set out to test this idea of imagination being central to uh, autism and schizophrenia in particular by genotyping a set of schizophrenia risk alleles and determining whether they were indeed associated with high levels of imagination. So for almost a thousand subjects, we genotyped them for 33 of what were at the time, a couple of years ago, the top schizophrenia risk alleles to generate an overall genetic risk score. And the prediction was that this schizophrenia genetic risk score should be associated with imagination, in particular the autism quotient measure of imagination. People with more schizophrenia risk alleles should have higher imagination, which means they should have a lower score on the autism quotient subscale for imagination, because a higher score means more autistic, which means lower imagination. So here is our list of SNPs. And here are the main results, different genetic models. We looked at males and females separately. And for two of the models, the recessive model and the additive model, and specifically for males, these prediction, the prediction was met. Higher schizophrenia genetic risk, the more so-called schizophrenia risk alleles one has, the higher imagination one has by this autism subscale. And this was specifically found just for males. So in conclusion, there is evidence from this work and, and a variety of work that I don't have time to go into today that imagination in particular is differentially decreased on the autism spectrum and pathologically increased on the psychotic affective spectrum. We have evidence from our genetic data that many so-called schizophrenia risk alleles appear to essentially be imagination alleles that presumably have been selected for in the course of human evolution. We're testing this now with the more recent set of, of schizophrenia risk alleles. Why is this important? Therapies for both sets of conditions to the extent that imagination is central to autism and to schizophrenia. Therapies for both sets of conditions can target imagination and can target activation and connectivity of the default mode network of the brain. And this tells us specifically what therapies may be useful. And this is not really a novel idea. People are, people are doing very similar types of therapies, but they have not been motivated by this sort of, of, of context. And finally, you, this data suggests that human imagination and risks of mental disorder have evolved closely together. So this evolutionary perspective can be directly useful in understanding and treating mental disorders. Thank you.